Hello and welcome. I'm Alan Cowan, Chief Scientist of Hume AI and a former Google research researcher um, and UC Berkeley PhD. I'm incredibly inspired by all the work that's been presented so far today. It's really humbling to see all of this come to fruition. Um, and in this talk, I wanted to take a step back and take stock of some of the scientific advances that are paving the way for a new understanding of expressive behavior. Uh, that have led up to the EXVO workshop and competition and many more workshops and competitions and papers to come. Nonverbal expressions are really important to understand because they're a huge part of how we communicate in everyday life, particularly when it comes to how we communicate our wants and needs. We usually don't articulate our feelings or sentiments in words, for example, we're more likely to gasp or make a face uh, than to say explicitly that something is scary or unpleasant or interesting. And those signals are often more informative than words when we communicate our feelings, sentiments, attitudes, and needs, and when we do so rapidly and succinctly. So expressions are particularly important to understand when it comes to understanding human needs, human mental health, human well-being, and how to improve human well-being. And although they aren't direct windows into our emotions or minds, expressions can be highly informative. Uh, these are all separate responses to the same video elicitor, for example. Oh, God. Oh. Uh, so I'll talk more about that data set later. Uh, lately, machine learning has been making exponential strides in understanding natural language. Uh, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to understanding nonverbal expression. And I think part of that has to do with uh, the immaturity of the science of emotion and expressive behavior. And another big part of it is that historically we've lacked good data to train models of expressive behavior. So today I'm mostly going to be talking about data. Um, but to get there, I want to start by introducing a new way of thinking about emotions, how we express them. Uh, semantic space theory. And that's provided the foundation for data-driven approaches to understanding human expression. I'll talk about how these approaches paint a much more complex and high-dimensional picture of expression than what's traditionally been understood and kind of taught in emotion science textbooks. And then I'll talk about how we're gathering the data that uh, we hope is going to allow machine learning researchers to translate these advances in emotion science and the science of expression into more formal predictive and generative models. Before semantic space theory, uh, there were two dominant approaches to classifying emotional expression. The six basics approach, which sorts emotional expressions into six categories, and the affective circumplex approach, which measures expressions in terms of valence, how unpleasant or pleasant someone seems to be feeling, and arousal, how calm or excited they are. There are also approaches uh, motivated by appraisal theory, um, which measure expression in terms of dimensions like safety, novelty, and power. And there have been a lot of debates about which of these approaches is best. But semantic space theory comes from a different perspective and argues that if you're choosing among approaches like these, you're conflating a lot of different questions about expressive behavior. So instead of asking whether specific expressions map to specific feelings or appraisal dimensions, we should be leaving room to derive taxonomies of emotion-related behavior and expressive behavior from the data itself. And semantic space theory leaves room for us to do that by making minimal assumptions about the nature of expressive behavior. It just assumes that an expressive behavior, as it conveys an emotional state or an emotional state that somebody reports, is really just a point within a metric space. And that space is defined by three properties. The first being its dimensionality, or the number of varieties of emotion. The second being the distribution of states within the space, so how things are structured, whether things are clustered or continuous, for example. And the third being how we conceptualize states within this space. 
So how emotion and mental state related concepts like awe and valence actually tile this space of expressions or behaviors. So the question is how the dimensionality, distribution, and conceptualization of emotion can be derived from the data itself. And then you can ask how these things vary across individuals and how they vary across cultures. So the task is really to characterize the latent metric space that explains the relationship between expressive behaviors and the phenomena that they're purported to explain, which generally include perceived meaning, so what meanings do people take away from expressive behaviors, self-report, um, so what emotions are people expressing, what attitudes and sentiments and beliefs are they expressing, um, self-reported experience, uh, what, again, what emotions people are expressing in relation to a context, um, physiological responses, uh, heart rates, uh, respiration, heart rate variability, and so forth, and social context. Um, so what is the situation people are in? Are they giving a talk? Are they playing a sport? Uh, are they having a conversation? During that conversation, uh, what is their state? What information are they relaying? What information are they taking in? What are their sentiments and so forth? So we spent five years gathering new kinds of data to characterize semantic spaces in different modalities of expressive behavior. Uh, we gathered thousands of naturalistic expressions, got large samples of participants in different countries to rate them using open-ended surveys uh, to rate what they were perceiving or experiencing at a given time. Uh, we even put people in fMRI scanners to look at their brain activity while this was going on. Um, and we looked at the context of expressions in everyday life uh, by training models and looking at how people's expressive behavior varies in different contexts found in videos around the world. And across all of this research, we arrived at a very different picture of human expressive behavior than what's traditionally taught. Expressive behaviors are not reducible to six clusters. They're not reducible to two dimensions. Uh, they're both high dimensional and smoothly distributed and complex. And the most precise and consistent way that people conceptualize emotional expressions and uh, expressive behaviors is in terms of nuanced emotional and mental states. The six basics approach and the affective circumplex approach each capture less than 30% of the variance that people take away from expressions. And these motions and mental states that people infer tend to predict things uh, like appraisal attributions, like how safe or unsafe someone seems to be, uh, what kinds of experiences someone might be having, insofar as those are reliable and predictable. Uh, so these findings um, have been influential in emotion science, and the EXFO workshop is part of a broader effort that we're undertaking to translate them into machine learning advances. For the EXFO workshop, uh, we decided to focus on vocal bursts which uh, we keep finding are one of the richest and most informative ways that people express emotion. And people hadn't really studied vocal bursts very thoroughly, even in emotion science. So when I first started studying vocal bursts, I was pretty surprised at how rich they are, given how little attention they've received. And the first thing we did is we assembled thousands of vocal bursts. We gathered ratings of them. And we simply looked at the distribution of those ratings and determined what was reliable across different people. And we found smooth gradients between vocal bursts that people reliably associate with at least 24 different dimensions of meaning. So let me explore those dimensions a little bit. So we have vocal bursts that convey reliably fear, <laughs> surprise, Uh, uh, forms a gradient with realization, realization with interest, interest with confusion. Over here we have a gradient from adoration through sympathy, through disappointment. 
to contempt, to disgust, which connects to anger, and to pain. Over here, there's a cluster with amusement <laughs> and embarrassment. Uh, embarrassment links to triumph and elation. And then, of course, we have sadness. So vocal blurs are these incredibly rich signals that convey many, many different dimensions of meaning. And if you try to force these into six categories, for example, uh, you end up capturing a small fraction of the variance. The high dimensionality of expressive behaviors like vocal bursts, of course, poses a challenge for machine learning. Uh, you need a lot of data to really disentangle all of these different dimensions. And so that's what motivated us to start collecting data sets like the Hume VB data set. Um, the full Hume VB data set now includes about 300,000 vocal bursts. Uh, we've been collecting them by recruiting people in different countries to imitate a really wide range of vocal bursts that we found predicts many, many different judgments of uh, the meaning that vocal bursts convey so that it inhabits the full space that we're aware vocal bursts uh, convey in meaning, um, but by collecting imitations, we're able to gather the same vocal bursts in different cultures, uh, from different demographics, genders, ages, uh, and so forth. So anyone who participated in the competition is really familiar with these sounds by now, um, but there were also a lot of uh, dimensions that didn't make it into the subset that we used for this competition. So I just want to explore those samples a little bit more. So each of these letters is actually not a single vocal burst, but imitations of that vocal bursts in a given culture. So uh, in, for example, China, we can look at imitations of a given laugh, <laughs> uh, or an embarrassment sound, interest, surprise, and so forth. And so if we take a given surprise sound, uh, we can look in India and see how that sounds, in South Africa, in the United States, and in Venezuela. So all of these, you know, not all of these, but some of these were included in the Exivo data set, um, but we didn't include everything. Um, for example, I don't think we had realization, um, embarrassment, uh, we had horror and fear, um, we probably didn't have boredom. So you can see it gets a lot more complicated um, and there's potential here to extract a lot of different dimensions of meaning. With this kind of data, we've also been extracting new psychological insights about the nature of vocal bursts. So for one thing, the meanings of vocal bursts are very consistent across cultures, much more so than, for example, facial expressions and speech prosody. So we've trained models to predict judgments of each inferred emotion and mental state within each culture separately in the native language of that culture. Um, so uh, we are predicting uh, adoration and its most direct translation into Spanish and Chinese in this case. Um, and the same judgment um, from English speakers in India and uh, the US. And uh, what we find is that the meanings are extremely consistent and we do this using multidimensional reliability analysis. Uh, so we used a method called PPCA to compare the dimensions of meaning that our model is able to extract from vocal bursts with people's actual judgments. Um, and what we found is that there were 24 significant dimensions across all cultures, and these are the loadings of those dimensions on judgments in each individual culture. So each of these little groups of five squares includes the loadings 
of an emotion or mental state term and its most direct translation across the five cultures on each dimension. So that red diagonal through the middle indicates that the primary meaning assigned to each vocal bursts is very similar across cultures. And overall, 80% of the variance in the meaning of the vocal bursts in terms of its loadings on each dimension was preserved across cultures. So what's next for EXVO? Um, well, there's a lot more that we can do with the Hume VB data set. Um, and of course, we're moving well beyond vocal bursts and exploring many other modalities. So just with the Hume VB data set, we've gathered a lot of different kinds of labels uh, to train other nuanced models of vocal expression. So in our next competition, uh, which will be at Aki in October, one of the four challenges that we're posing is to predict vocal burst types, like laughs, screams, sighs, and so forth. And we've actually developed a broader taxonomy of those call types. And we're able to predict them really accurately using uh, machine learning models. Uh, so let's explore some of those call types. They range from things like gasps, which can convey surprise and fear and awe. Oh. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to explore this one, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, they range from things like gasps uh, to O's, uh, screams, ahas, cackles, chuckles, huhs, has. Mm -hmm. So lots and lots of variation, over 67 dimensions here, some of which uh, carry differences in meaning, uh, some of which uh, don't. Um, but you can imagine the applications of being able tra to transcribe these sounds. Everything that we've done for vocal bursts, we've also done for facial expressions. Uh, so we've collected over 500,000 facial expressions in six different cultures, and again, it's a much more complex space than we would have thought. Uh, we find upwards of 21 dimensions that are shared very consistently across the cultures that we've looked at, and seven more dimensions, so 28 in total, seven dimensions that have varying levels of cultural specificity, um, as you can see on the bottom here. So again, we're hoping to translate advances in the science of emotion into machine learning models that are more accurate, have less bias, more cultural specificity. Um, we've collected a similar data set for speech prosody, um, which is very similar to the Hume VB data set that was the subject of this competition. And here we've also collected over 500,000 samples so far. Um, many of them are lexically controlled, meaning that we can disentangle lexical features, so the words somebody is using, from prosodic features, so how they actually say those words. So let's explore uh, the dimensions of speech prosody. Um, and these are actually going to be predictions of a trained model on naturalistic samples that the model hasn't seen before. It's an incredibly nuanced space. Um, there's dimensions like determination. You're not dying, Hope. You're going to live a long, healthy life. Anger. Screw her, that part is mine. Disappointment. Oh, I forgot about the birthday cake. Anxiety. Because I think I just heard her moving around. It. Confusion. I'm sorry. So, um, so where are Amusement. Okay, I'll be up in... 18 pages. <laughs> and as you can see, it's a very continuous space uh, with blends between different kinds of meaning. Uh, so you can have kind of confused amusement. You liked it? You really liked it? When did that happen to you? <laughs> and we're collecting different kinds of large-scale data using other kinds of experiments to be able to train higher-level multimodal models. So one question is how multimodal patterns in expression relate to emotional experience. And uh, to answer that question, we've collected over 250,000 reactions to 1,841 
highly evocative videos across five different countries. And so far, what we found is that if you aggregate across many people's responses to a video, you can reliably predict the average emotional experiences evoked by the video along at least 12 different dimensions. So in these maps, each letter represents a video. The colors in the map on the left represent the average reported experiences in response to the video. And the colors in the map on the right represent the average expressive responses to the video. So at the aggregate level, you can make really fine-grained inferences of the experiences people say they're having on average from people's expressions. But this doesn't work as well uh, at the individual level. It's worth noting. And so finally, moving beyond the individual to model how expressions function in social interactions, we've also been collecting data with expressive conversations. We use uh, carefully constructed prompts to evoke conversations that naturally include a wide range of emotional expressions. And people form expressions spontaneously, pretty often in these conversations. Um, and we collected their own self-report annotations at a fine-grained level of the emotions that they thought they were expressing during the conversation and that they thought the other person was expressing from each participant. What? What's the worst thing you've ever eaten? Um, black mushrooms. Oh, yeah, I remember. So you can see there's a disgust expression in there. Sometimes the conversations are longer and they can get uh, pretty touching. All right. So name one thing you are grateful to me for. Grateful to you? Always being there for me. Um, for being my friend. Uh, that's about it, man. <laughs> Try to think hard. Uh, 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 you, uh, you, you make know, me it's stuff I don't want to say here, but, uh, <laughs> you make but me I, I do love you. Oh, I love you too. You. <laughs> That's the emotion. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I'm grateful to have you. I'm grateful to have you, Kim. Thank God this is over with. We got seven seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you get the idea. Um, obviously, participants uh, were given like really clear warnings and consents and all of that, that uh, these videos would be used in public settings and used for uh, data science and machine learning. Um, and the prompt here is pretty funny. Uh, sometimes we have prompts like, make your best uh, pterodactyl sound. What? So anyway, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> you can invoke emotions in a lot of different ways uh, in dyadic settings. So overall, what we're hoping to do is pave a path from advances in emotion science to new technologies for understanding expressive communication. And to recap a little bit, I talked about how open-ended approaches to emotion uh, based on semantic space theory paint a more nuanced picture of human expressive behavior than was traditionally assumed. And in fact, when you sort expressions into six categories or along two dimensions, that turns out to capture less than a third of the information that people reliably glean from facial expressions, vocal bursts, speech prosody, multimodal expressions, and so forth. Um, and that means that affective computing methods that are based on those older taxonomies are really missing a, a big part of the picture. With new uh, data sets and efforts like the Expo workshop, we're hoping to address the gap between advances in emotion science and machine learning research and applications. The data that we gather is in the wild, but we use large-scale experiments that allow for a more controlled measurement of how people represent uh, the emotions that they're communicating and expressing. And this is perfect for prediction tasks. Uh, we've also seen today that dealing with in the wild data is an important challenge for generative tasks. And it's becoming feasible 
uh, by using pre-trained models that inherently involve a cleaner representation of data. Another approach uh, that we've been using is to take prediction models and use them to mine for clean data um, using for generative tasks. And that's in some ways the best of both worlds because you can combine psychologically valid measures derived from in the wild expressions with high quality recordings of those same expressions. Ultimately, we're hoping to pave the way for new technologies that use expressive communication to better address human needs and improve human well being. Earlier, we saw one incredible example application and accessibility from Yutuan Shen in his talk about Project Euphonia. Other great applications include mental health and AI value alignment. And we're working with a separate nonprofit, the Human Initiative, to establish guidelines uh, for how those kinds of use cases should be pursued. And with that, I'd like to thank the team at Hume AI and uh, the Human Initiative for making all of this possible. And I'd like to thank, of course, the Exvo participants and everyone here for coming. Um, and if you're interested in accessing any of the resources that I discussed today, the easiest way is to sign up at Hume.ai. And with that, I'd love to answer your questions. <laughs>